next speaker has a PhD in emergency management from North Dakota State University. Her research primarily focuses on disaster recovery and disaster nonprofits and volunteerism. Please welcome to the stage, Samantha Montano. All right, so first of all, thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you for Lauren and everyone else for organizing all of this. Okay, so before we get started here, I wanna do a quick little survey of the audience. So how many of you were here earlier today for Mika's talk? Okay, good, lots of you. She did a great, laid a great foundation for what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, the other question I have for you is how many of you have actually experienced a disaster before? If you're comfortable saying, have you been through a tornado, hurricane, something like that. Okay, so several of you. All right, good. So, uh, the first time that I remember hearing about climate change, I was in the sixth grade. My science teacher told us that in the future, the world was gonna get really hot. She evoked these apocalyptic, this apocalyptic imagery, right? The Statue of Liberty underwater in New York City, um, a drought in the Midwest worse than the Dust Bowl, and this kind of Mad Max Wild West. She told us, don't worry though, this is fine. Your generation is going to solve climate change. Okay, great, didn't quite sign up for that, no pressure, but fine, challenge accepted. So with nothing but the future of the world on our shoulders, I did what everyone else around me was doing. I watched Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, I recycled, I tried unsuccessfully to convince my parents to buy a Prius. Okay, so I tried to convince my parents to buy a Prius, they wouldn't go for it. I echoed my sixth grade science teacher when I wrote my college application essay. I wrote all about how my generation was going to come together and solve climate change and save the world. Blinded by young, naive optimism, I never stopped to really interrogate what exactly solving climate change might mean. Nor did I think about how we might go about approaching all of this solving of climate change that we were going to be doing. So even though everyone seemed to know we needed to be doing something, it was, climate change was still being framed as something of the future. A hundred years from now, our great grandkids. So I never felt this sense of urgency. Then one day I looked up and I realized that we didn't stop climate change. That all around the world, communities were already beginning to experience the consequences of climate change eroding shorelines in Tasmania. Even before Hurricane Harvey, the city of Houston and the surrounding areas had already experienced five floods in 13 months. 20 million people across the world in Somalia, Yemen, Nigeria, and South Sudan were facing famine. That there were Alaskans searching for relocation funds as their villages literally eroded into the ocean. That the war and refugee crisis in Syria hastened by severe drought. And that in South Louisiana, there were members of local tribes that were being forced to relocate inland as their land disappeared. I realized that climate change was not something that was going to be happening in the future that it was happening now. There's not some light switch that will just switch on and this apocalypse that we imagine will befall us. It's a slow march and we're already walking. So I thought back to my sixth grade science class and I thought that maybe the solving that she was expecting us to do wasn't so much about preventing the climate from changing altogether, we were young enough, after all, where those decisions had already been made. We didn't have influence over those. They were out of our control. But that actually maybe the solving that she was talking about was more about how we were going to figure out how to adapt to a new climate and how to manage the consequences and try to minimize the suffering. This list of places that I've gone over isn't necessarily the apocalypse that we were warned about, but there are certainly people and communities and countries across the world that are already being harmed. The consequences have already begun, and there's nothing in the research 
that suggests that these things aren't going to continue. So climate change is by no means the only cause of these disasters, and I'm going to come back and talk about that a bit more in a minute. But climate change is a factor in each of these situations. There is some good news, though. Disasters are not some new phenomenon that have been created by climate change. We've always had disasters. They're normal and constant and an expected part of the world for all of human history. And because disasters have happened all the time, we've created an entire system for dealing with them, the emergency management system. So my first experience with a disaster was after Katrina and the levee failure in New Orleans. I, like thousands of others, went down to the city to help with the rebuilding efforts. To say that many of the survivors were struggling after Katrina would be an understatement. No one, including the federal government, seemed to disagree that the emergency management system wasn't working. I was impressionable, and I had an inclination towards justice, and I looked around, and all I saw were injustices. So by the end of the volunteer week, I had heard quite enough about how the recovery was progressing, or rather how it wasn't progressing, and I went home to my parents and announced I was moving to New Orleans. So everyone there, so I did, and everyone in New Orleans was upset and angry about what had happened and what was happening, but the survivors, with the help of quite literally millions of volunteers from across the country and the world, came together and did the work themselves. No one in that city was just sitting around waiting for, emergency, for the emergency management system to get together and help people recover quickly. They just started doing it themselves. So then while I was living in New Orleans, the BP oil disaster happened. And I spent some time commuting back and forth from the city to the shore. If I hadn't already been convinced of the horrors of our oil addiction, sneaking under police lines to see men in white suits collecting dead animals off the shore of Grand Isle certainly did me in. I stood next to the BP survivors who, despite their strength, were hurt emotionally, economically, and physically. They were overwhelmed and, again, abandoned by the so-called emergency management system. People's needs just weren't being addressed by this formal system. Again, where needs were being met, it was by the community coming together, by volunteers, the media attention we brought with us, and nonprofits. Then I went to Joplin, Missouri, right down the road, and Tuscaloosa, Alabama, after their tornadoes. And there, too, I looked around, and I didn't see people in FEMA jackets. I didn't see that formal response, although it was much more organized than New Orleans had been. But what I continued to see was that there were survivors and volunteers out doing a lot of this work. So after these disasters, I started to put connect some dots here. And I saw that although each of these disasters was unique in terms of the actual hazard, the size, the impacts, and the needs, and the location, that the experiences of the community during those disasters were remarkably similar. Seeing these other disasters made me rethink how I saw post-Katrina New Orleans. It made me think that the inefficiencies and the ineffectiveness and the inequalities weren't something that were somehow unique to New Orleans, but were actually inherent to the emergency management system itself. Maybe the way I was seeing people recover from Katrina and BP didn't represent a failure of the emergency management system, but maybe, how, maybe that was how the emergency management system was actually built this slow and painful process of rebuilding your life after disaster, confusing and conflicting directions when you finally do get somebody on the phone, not getting enough money from insurance, no place to temporarily live while you fix your houses, increases in domestic violence and stress, clear disparities in recovery that ran along the lines of race, class, gender, and their intersection, 
All around the country, survivors were dealing with these exact same issues, and the system didn't seem to be effectively or efficiently addressing them. Since I felt like there was a problem with the whole system, and not something just unique to New Orleans, it seemed like learning as much about the emergency management system was the next step and the best way to help more than just New Orleans, but all survivors. So I did what anybody would do. I left the beautiful, magical city of New Orleans, and I moved to the frozen, barren tundra of Fargo, North Dakota. It's like the movie, yes. Um, I did so because I had found out there were people there who were actually studying disasters, people who saw what I saw, that the way the system was operating wasn't meeting the people's needs, people who realized that we needed to know more in order to do better. I came to find out that actually people have been studying disasters for quite a long time across just about every discipline you can think of. We have the hazard scientists, like the seismologists and volcanologists. We have climatologists, sociologists, psychologists, economists, engineers, even musicians and artists, right, are studying disasters. All of these people are doing this really important work. And I kind of group the people who are actually setting together disasters together and call them disasterologists, because that's what they're doing. They're studying disasters. The problem, of course, is that when you have this many people from this many backgrounds all studying disasters, things start getting lost in translation. Economists and sociologists aren't exactly known for being on the same wavelength. Music scholars and volcanologists are not speaking the same language. So a lot of disciplines were producing a lot of research, but nobody was pulling it all together. There were a lot of gaps in what we were studying, and there was no one synthesizing these findings together. So a lot of it wasn't getting back out and integrated into how we were doing emergency management. It's great that meteorologists can tell us that there's a hurricane forming, but we need psychologists and sociologists to tell us how people are going to react to evacuation warnings. And we need transportation researchers to tell us how to redirect the flow of traffic. So out of this need of, for synthesizing the research, has emerged this discipline of emergency management. It is this new little baby discipline. There's not a lot of us doing it, but it's really, really important, and there are a lot of really smart people who are doing really meaningful work. To me, the emergence of this discipline of emergency management is the outgrowth of hundreds of years of disaster-related science. Through this science, we have drastically changed our perception of what causes disasters, and more recently, we have begun to change the way that we manage them. So for most of human history, disasters were viewed as acts of God, events that we couldn't stop and had no control over, retribution for all manners of sins. Then the science started evolving as our understanding of the natural world advanced. We started to understand that most of these events were natural disasters. They're part of our natural world. The earth wasn't shaking because God was mad at us, it was because we were standing on a fault line. But even with the science explaining what an earthquake was, we still were blaming something that was out of our control for these disasters. We can't, I can't control earthquakes, they're part of nature, right? Now you hear disasterologists saying, there's no such thing as a natural disaster. After every single disaster, you will hear a reporter, I want you to watch for this now in the media, you'll see it all the time. After every disaster, you hear a reporter interviewing a survivor who says something along the lines of, this flood, this tornado, whatever, this, this was no natural disaster. It was because so-and-so let us build here. It's because the building codes weren't good enough. They didn't maintain this levee. We developed in a floodplain. What that comment consistently represents is the shift in our understanding of what causes disasters. A tornado alone by itself is not a disaster, nor is a hurricane, nor is an earthquake. 
it only, this hazard only turns into a disaster when it interacts with people, places, and the things that we care about negatively and to the point of us being overwhelmed. So if you're a farmer and it rains just like it normally does, that's great, you're happy, that's not a disaster. But if it rains way more than usual and starts to flood everything, then we're on our way to it being a disaster. It's got to be negative, or it has to be some, about something that we care about. So if you're a farmer and it's just your back field that floods, it's not something you're using right now, it's not a disaster, right? You don't care about it, it'll flood out in a few days. And you have to be overwhelmed. It can't just be one person's house that floods, although that is, of course, a disaster for that person, but it has to start overwhelming the community. It has to flood your crops, your house, your car, your neighbor's houses, your town center, your schools, your grocery stores. The roads in and out of town have to be shut down, right? It has to overwhelm the community. And so this is what people are beginning to realize when they say this wasn't a natural disaster. The hazard may be natural, but us being there in its way, that's not natural, that's on us. So, of course, the major implication here is that if disasters aren't acts of God, and if they're not natural, then it's us. We are responsible. It's how and where we build, it's our laws and our policies, the decisions that we make that cause disaster. But the good news is, is that this means that we actually have a lot of control here. It means that we can change our actions, and it means that all disasters aren't necessar necessarily inevitable. So this here is the disaster life cycle, and I promise I won't get too academic and boring here. Um, but this is kind of the process through which disasters happen. Um, and this is what emergency management does. So the thing that you probably all think about most is the response. So that is the flashing lights, the things that superhero movies and disaster movie dreams are all made of. That's what they focus on. The time period where the hazard is happening, so the tornado or the hurricane or whatever is headed your way, and you start to take actions to save lives, property, and the environment. This means things like turning on the tornado sirens and taking shelter and evacuating and doing search and rescue and getting people medical attention and giving them food and water and getting them into shelters. All of that life-saving stuff that happens. Most of the time, though, that's only happening over a couple of days. And yet that's where most of our focus is on. It's after the response as we move into recovery that things start being on a much longer time scale. So recovery is when we start doing the things to reshape and rebuild and reestablish our communities. Things like putting the utilities back, getting the utilities back up and running, clearing debris, rebuilding homes, rebuilding schools, restarting the, the economy. These are the things that happen over a much longer period of time, months, years, sometimes even decades. And then we have mitigation, which sometimes we like to see happen during recovery, but it can happen before as well. This is doing things that are sustained actions to reduce or eliminate our risk of disaster. So this is what we want to spend a lot of our time doing because it prevents the disasters from happening in the first place. No matter how much mitigation we do, though, we still are going to have some risk of disasters, and so we need to be prepared. And I won't spend a lot of time here, because Mika already covered this for us today. Uh, but preparedness is when you're doing things to ready yourself for that response and for that recovery. So doing things to make sure that we're better able to save lives during the response and that we can get people back up and running as quickly as possible after the disaster happens. So here's the thing. When I was standing in New Orleans during the recovery, I thought that emergency managers were the ones who were doing all of this work. It was an emergency. They're called emergency managers. They're supposed to be like managing the situation. 
I didn't have a name for it then, but what I was envisioning in my head, I, I wasn't seeing it play out. And what I was envisioning was the formal emergency management system. So these are all of the people and organizations that know they're going to be involved in dealing with disaster. The groups that plan to be involved, who know what their roles and responsibilities are, who train and prepare together. So people like FEMA, state, local, tribal, county emergency management agencies, first responders like fire and police, other government agencies like departments of transportation, right, all that fun stuff. Um, and then also disaster nonprofits, the Red Cross, Salvation Army. So that's the system that most of us probably think about when disaster strikes. The system that we assume is going to be there to guide us through this situation. The system that is there ahead of time planning for these disasters and trying to prevent them. And then when disaster strikes and you look around and you don't really see these people or you don't see many of them, it can be really frustrating and confusing to say the least. It can seem like the system has failed. Now, to the formal system's credit, they were there in New Orleans. I just didn't know where to look for them, right? They were operating mostly behind the scenes out of my view. Um, there's a lot of really good people who are working within this formal system, but they cannot do it all. They don't have the money, the resources, the technical abilities, the logistical abilities, the authority even, to address every single need that comes up during this life cycle of disasters. So what I've come to understand is that it's not just these people and these groups who are making up our emergency management system, but there's actually an entire second half, the informal system. This informal system includes quite literally everyone else. All of us, all of you, we are all a part of this informal system. These are the people who tend to, during response, they tend to only get involved during response um, and after the disaster happens. So these are grassroots groups in your community. There are local churches and community groups, nonprofits in your community like your food pantry and other nonprofits that don't have a day-to-day -day disaster mission who all of a sudden see that there is a need in their community and become involved in helping to address it. We also see emergent groups, something that Mika also kind of started to address earlier today. So this is when, during a disaster, people come together and new groups start forming. This happens in all phases, right, but they're most commonly known in response. Uh, and then we also see that survivors are doing all different kinds of things during and after a disaster, and that businesses start to get involved also. So here's the big challenge, though. That is a whole lot of people doing a whole lot of stuff, literally every minute of every day, all over the world. And very few of these people are coordinating with each other. Only some of them are even sometimes following some kind of a plan. Some of them don't even see what they're doing as emergency management. So every time you go to the store and buy extra batteries to keep around the house, you're doing disaster preparedness and you're participating in this informal system. So we can talk about what we should do about this system. It's not perfect. We need to make a lot of changes to, changes to it and we need to make it better. But the starting point is recognizing that the emergency management system is this whole system, not just the formal. And this is why the discipline of emergency management is so important. Because, although an emer because through an emergency management framework, we can study all of the different parts of this system, and we can pull all of the vitally important findings from scholars in all the other disciplines together, start building off of that foundational research, and start to find answers to questions like what factors lead to re communities recovering more effectively and efficiently, what can we do to optimize volunteer labor, how can we encourage coordination among multiple levels of government, 
how can that pro-social behavior that occurs naturally during a disaster be accounted for in our emergency management planning? And what factors actually lead to communities implementing mitigation measures? And how can we help foster those things in our communities? As we find answers to these types of questions, we can then turn around and work with emergency managers to change the way we do emergency management. We can push for policies and programs to be designed around the findings of empirical research rather than making these quick knee-jerk decisions based on the experience of a single disaster. It's a long and a slow process, but it is happening. We can change the way we prepare, mitigate, respond, and recover, and we can do it more effectively, more efficiently, and more equitably. I know that the science and research here can matter because it already has. I'll just give one example. In the US, although we've seen an increase in disasters, we've also seen a decline in death tolls. Much of this can be attributed to the science that people in disasterology are doing. Advances in weather forecasting. We can now send out warnings when there is a tornado so that people know when to seek shelter. We have time to evacuate entire communities before hurricanes arrive, and we've figured out better ways to communicate risk. We're not always great at it, but we've gotten much better, to, so that people can take actions to protect themselves. And this is really, really good and really important because we're at a critical moment here. It's important to understand this progression in how we have understood the cause of disasters because at this moment, we're about to take on a lot of responsibility. There is no time and place for lingering thoughts about acts of gods or natural disasters that are outside of our control. This is all on us. Floods aren't new, droughts aren't new, wildfires aren't new, but what is new is the predicted scale and severity and frequency of these hazards. Particularly when we start pairing these changes with other factors that already make our communities vulnerable, things like population movement to high-risk areas, so like population movement to people wanting to live on the beach, poorly enforced regulations, decaying infrastructure, and poor development decisions. This situation all of a sudden quite literally becomes a recipe for disaster. So when we partner climate change with things like neglected infrastructure, we see situations like the recent Oroville spillway incident in California. When we consider that increases in population and development are incur occurring in areas that we already know are vulnerable to hazards that will be made worse by climate change, we start to get situations like Hurricane Harvey. When we consider the relationship between climate change and factors of economic inequality, we see that some people will disproportionately be affected, like in Puerto Rico. So sure, we absolutely need to stop and reverse climate change, and there are a lot of people out there working on that. But we have this second huge problem that barely anyone is talking about. We have to solve how we're going to adapt our communities and how we're going to manage the consequences of climate change. It isn't as simple as moving a couple thousand homes. We need to do some major damage control. The hurricanes, flooding, storms, wildfires, droughts, and other climactic events are only going to get worse, and we need to be ready to manage them and to adapt to these realities of a different climate. The world around us is changing fast, and we have to change quickly, too. When envisioning a climate-changed world, it's easy to just picture these apocalyptic scenes in disaster movies, and although that world is technically possible, it's not the one that's in our imminent future. There are a lot of people and communities who will suffer the consequences of climate change long before the world becomes unlivable. Luckily, we have experience managing disasters, so we know that there are actions that we can take to minimize that suffering. The discipline of emergency management has insights for us for how our communities are likely to adapt, and importantly, how we will manage the disasters when we fail to adapt. But we need to do more. We need more people doing this work. 
This is not a time to be denying science, dismissing scientists, and defunding research. This is the time to quite literally do the opposite. We need to be doing anything and everything we can to help our communities get ready for what's coming. We need to start asking difficult questions, too. Who is going to keep paying to rebuild our schools when they're destroyed repeatedly by wildfires? Who is going to keep rebuilding people's homes when they're already living paycheck to paycheck, when they're immersed in floodwaters time and time again? And who decides when communities can no longer live where the generations before them have? These are really difficult questions. They're questions that we're not really talking about. And they're questions that all of a sudden we now start needing to have answers to. So I hope that your one takeaway from this talk is that disasters don't have to be a normal occurrence. Many of them are not inevitable. There are things that we can do to prevent disasters from happening, to adapt our communities, and to be better prepared to respond and recover when they do happen. I'm not still blinded by young, naive optimism. There's a long road ahead of us. Solving climate change doesn't mean to me stopping climate change. It means managing the consequence so that as few people as possible are harmed. And at least for now, I think the approach to doing this is to use the research. Many of the solutions to what's coming are buried in academic journals, just waiting for emergency management scholars to dig them back out and hand them over to emergency managers, nonprofits, policymakers to each of you so that we can start making better and informed decisions. These disasters aren't acts of God. They're not some natural event that we have no control over. This is a solvable problem and we're not helpless. So I know I've thrown kind of a lot of information at you. Um, hopefully I've helped make some connections for you or changed your perspective on things a bit. Um, I'll be around now for a little while if you have any pressing questions uh, for me. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter or at my blog if you want to know more about disasters generally. Um, keep up with research and policy type stuff. I use a lot of GIFs on Twitter, so it's not too boring. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah! Yeah!